Good afternoon, folk. Uh, welcome to my talk on state preemption and education policy. Um, to give you a little bit of a heads up, some people may be trickling in uh, later. Uh, another thing I should share with you is that we'll be using a question and answer function. If you can look at your uh, Zoom screen, uh, if you have any questions throughout, I'll try to address them at the end. Uh, also, uh, at the end, we'll give some time for it if you don't want to type out all of your uh, questions and get answers typed out, I can go ahead and also uh, get you recognized that you can speak. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. A uh, quick agenda for what's going to happen today. Uh, of course, as a faculty member, I think that I'm going to get this done in 30 minutes and have 30 minutes for actual deep discussion, but I may not. Uh, we'll start with an introduction. Uh, a quick definition and analysis of what preemption is for those people who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, current trends in curricular pre preemption. Uh, consequences of contemporary curricular pre preemption is in the news. It may not be called that, but you'll see in a second. And possible responses to these current trends. Uh, before we get started, I think it's important that you know who I am. Uh, personally, I am an uh, ex-lawyer turned educator, a uh, former social studies teacher in New Orleans public schools and private schools uh, that ended up as an instructional coach before leaving to go to the Southern Poverty Law Center where I worked on special education, uh, law policy and practice. Uh, I combined that with some juvenile justice work and then after that went off to Penn State to work on my PhD. Uh, during my time at uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the things that I realized was that a lot of school leaders didn't really fully understand law or have legal literacy as we would call it. And my job was to actually train them ultimately to have that legal literacy. And I think that will impact students in classrooms and communities uh, outside of school buildings. Uh, academically, I am a law and society scholar. Specifically, I'm a civil rights uh, based law scholar. Most of my work is in schools and schooling, uh, which does not always uh, <laughs> interact with each other, unfortunately. Uh, in addition to that, most of my work is not concerned about how cases are decided, but how law policy and cases decided by courts actually impact people on the ground. In this particular case for this lecture, you're going to hear me talk a little bit about legislation uh, that is either pending or has been passed in different states uh, that is impacting people on the ground, namely uh, educators, sometimes students and families. Uh, professionally, I am an associate professor here at UNLV in the Education, Pol po education <laughs> Policy and Leadership Program. Uh, I teach most of our school law courses uh, and sometimes teach the internship course. So you might be asking, what is preemption? So broadly, what we consider preemption in law is this idea that the state in and of itself in preemption is leveraging, uh, usually through the legislature, its power to nullify local ordinances. Uh, so basically imagine a world, right, where a city passes a law or a passes an ordinance, I'm sorry, and a state legislature then says, look, we're not in favor of this. And in order to get rid of this, we're actually going to pass a law that supersedes it, making it illegal for them to do that. You've seen it lately uh, in some pretty obvious context. Uh, the one that we'll speak about today is education, education policy, uh, education, and specifically around curricular preemption. Uh, so the question that you'll probably be asking is, well, is state preemption wrong? And I put wrong in quotation marks because at the core, I think it's hard for us to think, you know, exactly of what is right and wrong. I think there's some ethical uh, discussions to be had. For me, I do uh, particularly think uh, the way that states are preempting uh, curricular uh, preempting curricular changes uh, is wrong in this context, but we do like it sometimes. So I, I don't want to say that preemption is always a bad thing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about when it has been good and when it hasn't been. Uh, but sometimes it's abusive. And that's what I write about, uh, abusive preemption. This idea that like we're actually using this to punish a certain set of people. And you'll later hear me say a word punitive where like sometimes this preemption is, the preemption is attached to something bigger. Like we're going to fine you or we're going to essentially uh, take away certain rights if you continue to do this. It's for me particularly abusive when we talk about civil rights. Uh, when we start seeing uh, essentially 
states start saying, we're going to create a ceiling for civil rights. So historically, state law has always been treated as a floor. You had you had to do the bare minimum here and cities could go higher. Municipal authority could go higher and demand more rights. Uh, you might have seen this maybe 20 years ago uh, with what popularly became known as gay marriage, where we started seeing states would not necessarily say that they were going to provide actual uh, benefits to uh, same-sex couples. However, certain cities were like, no, we actually will. We're going to make that a thing here. Uh, we'll see how that works out in a, in a, in a little bit of uh, what's going on now. This new wave of preemption is broadly uh, forcing uh, state law as a ceiling and anything that goes beyond that is a threat to states, a primary goal of being the legislative holder of power in states. Uh, and like I said, this is sometimes punitive. Think about CRT bans and something that we're not gonna talk about today, but like police reform. Remember uh, post George Floyd, there was a lot of discussion around uh, reforming police and defunding police. Uh, while there's some discuss there should be some discussion about the naming and what name what goes into a name and how it's treated. The idea that we're going to change funding or diminish funding and send it to other uh, places that needed it that might resolve crime became really big in states such uh, as Florida with House Bill One decided that broadly, if you if you lower your uh, the part of the preemption was if you lower funding to the police, we'll actually take over your police and you won't get any state funding. Uh, and we'll see how that's actually impacting like CRT bans, LGBTQ bans, and some other stuff going forward. Um, what does this look like? Uh, let me talk a little bit about the structure of education policy for those people who don't know. Uh, like broadly, uh, education historically, uh, well, constitutional, I should say, is a state right. And historically, states have kind of had complete control uh, up until maybe the 30s when we started seeing the state, the federal government start uh, inching closer and closer to some policy authority. I think that ends up ultimately bursting through the, the state, the federal government ends up bursting through the scenes around the mid 50s, uh, starting around that Brown era and some other federal legislation. Then since then we've had increasing influence of the federal government. Uh, in education policy. And most of that, as I talk about education federalism, thinking about the work that like uh, Derek Black and Kimberly Jenkins Robinson are doing around that, this idea that ultimately, uh, while it's a state right, through a variety of mechanisms, namely finance uh, and funding, uh, the federal government has kind of gain leverage in how we shape education policy and practice. Uh, look no further than ESEA, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, where we started funding, uh, if people know Title I, we started saying like, we're gonna give you these funds, but in return for these funds, we're gonna expect you to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you're familiar with like, probably you no know, Child Left Behind, Every Student that Succeeds Act, the newest version of ESEA, those are all related uh, policies. Uh, they're in the same lineage. Uh, but even within this structure of like the federal government giving money and then saying like, you have to do these little things and the state government saying, this is our territory and we're gonna actually uh, guide the way here. States, for the most part, with the exception of Hawaii, uh, have basically let local school boards dictate what education policy and practice look like. Uh, and they've had broad latitude, which is given by the state and can be taken back, uh, and many states are, uh, not all, but many are, are engaged in that. And so a state preemption, including abusive or preemptive preempt preemption, which we're going to be talking about today, is still relevant to education policy, even if the state does have all of this power and can take it back. The question is, should they be and when should they be and why are they doing it in this moment, this historical moment? So I want to talk about three examples. Uh, one, good preemption. The Pennsylvania Human Relations Committee in the 70s decided uh, that despite the fact that local school districts were building schools and passing policy, uh, that was leading to slightly better academic results, if we can call it that, that they were 
coincidentally maybe, says the state, I think more intentionally, contributing to de facto segregation. So essentially the state using its preemptive power said, we're gonna pass legislation saying that whatever you're doing over there in your district cannot contribute not just to legal segregation, but to also de facto segregation, which hamstrung a lot of school districts but in ways that we probably want them hamstrung. We don't actually want school districts to have the authority to essentially uh, segregate their schools. Abusive for me is what happened in a state of Arkansas post Brown, where literally the Little Rock School District was like, we actually don't like the idea of desegregation, but we're willing to do it. And then the state of Arkansas said, actually, no, if you do it, we'll defund you. Like, effectively telling the school district, we're going to preempt your action of desegregation by passing law specifically making you not just saying by policy we think you shouldn't, but by law, you by edict, you shouldn't. And then we talk about punitive. Uh, and punitive for me is a special category of, of abuse of preemption. Why do I say it's special in this case that like in CRT bans, as you'll see later, and Florida's don't say gay bill, uh, in a variety of other things you'll see later in language, we're saying not only are we going to be abusive, we're actually going to penalize sometimes if you're the case, I think, of Idaho, we're actually going to penalize individual teachers or educators for violating this law. Or sometimes if you're Missouri, we're going to penalize broadly uh, the entire school district. And that creates its own problems of, uh, of one, you'll see later, human resources, but also conflicts in policy and practice. Excuse me. Uh, so what are some historical trends that we've seen? We talk, we talk about school choice broadly, and we don't talk about it in the context of uh, how that might contribute to this idea of preemption. Uh, there were a number of school districts that said we don't want charter schools broadly, and that's more recently, uh, mid-2010 era, and then to recently, and we started seeing states say, that's fine. If you want, uh, if you won't authorize charter schools, we ourselves will start authorizing them and putting them in your districts. Uh, and sometimes running them as part of your district, sometimes running them as some entity outside uh, of <laughs> your school district, which got a couple of states, including, I think, uh, maybe Florida and Colorado in a little bit of trouble with their constitution. We'll talk about that later as well. But a form of preemption, a form of the state saying, y'all have this policy at the local level. We ourselves think we're going to oh, we're going to supersede it and change what you're doing. Curricular movements about narrowing and standards movement states going very specifically to this idea of we're going to set what makes uh, the curriculum work in a given setting and whatnot. And finally, thinking about governance, my area of research is typically state takeovers and selection processes for governing boards where states started getting involved very heavy handedly saying, we are now gonna tell you how to select your school board members or else we're gonna actually just come in and start selecting them ourselves or creating our own board to buck whatever you're doing. And what are these current trends? I, I wanna talk a little bit about cur curricular preemption that you are seeing in the news or have been seeing in the news. One is around race and this idea that we're going to preempt any discussion of, I'm going to call CRT, but as you as, if you read these, this legislation, it's actually very few of them really understand what CRT is. And more importantly, uh, they're actually, in many cases, banning things that are associated with other frameworks that are not CRT. Uh, Missouri going as far as saying that we're going to ban broadly uh, any discussion of race that makes this group of people, white people and students and parents uncomfortable. Uh, gender expression, and I put an asterisk by religion, uh, thinking specifically around white Christian perspectives being dominant and what we're leaning towards. A couple of Supreme Court cases that are coming out now, there are a couple at the state Supreme Court level, including one that just came out in Oklahoma that basically said, uh, religious schools are entitled to become charter schools. They are like literally breaching this idea of like now Christian schools may become public schools in and of themselves. Uh, and then governance and politics will state takeovers, as I said. 
Um, I'm sorry, it's moving this. Uh, what does this look like in terms of uh, the rise of cultural war? So I want to talk a little bit about uh, where we are in terms of curricular preemption and uh, CRT bands specifically. Uh, and I, I want to start in the 90s, but obviously this can, we can go well be back for, further than that. And one of these things uh, ideally being like culturally relevant teaching and culturally responsive pedagogy erode. I think they arrived to us, right? And early to mid 90s, it's like 93, 94, 95. So I'm not sure if we're calling it early or mid. So I'll say early to mid 90s. Uh, and for the most part, it was a lot of discussion and theoretical banter, but more recently we're getting more tangible results if you can call external dialogue results, right? Uh, so people are engaging in these topics more recently. And I think in, in, in very many ways, it is shaping not only what's happening in the academy, but shaping what's happening in the classrooms within the academy, but also shaping, shaping by that process what's happening in schools and in classrooms within schools. Uh, and like I said, obviously this work started before the 1990s. There's plenty of work that goes beyond what Geneva Gay or Gloria Latson Billings or uh, like what any of them were doing in the 90s. I, I think they coined a lot of these term, this terminology, but it was the groundwork was laid before then. Uh, since the rise of recent cultural wars, this idea that like now we're debating sometimes people's humanity, sometimes where they belong, we've seen more than half of states introduce bills to restrict efforts at teaching a pluralistic population of students. And that's actually really important as we're starting to finally see these ideas of like a diversifying teaching force, even if it's only marginally different, seeing like not just a diversified teaching force, but also this idea of these people in here are doing the cultural response of things that we actually are asking them to do in, in research and that are showing that these are the ways that you gain uh, ground academically and close opportunity gaps. Uh, but the interesting thing about the culture wars in race is that they, they also have served as an entree point, right, for additional bans related to transgender youth and bisexual gay and lesbian students, among other things. Uh, and it's starting to actually expand beyond school buildings. Uh, You'll, you'll find later that I, I think it's either Missouri or Tennessee that is actually basically saying we are going to ban by law any uh, sexual, any uh, gender reassignment surgeries for people under 18. It just won't even be an option, uh, which is both dangerous and oppressive. Sorry. I left this up here because I really want to uh, give you some time to read it. I'll read it with you. Uh, it's something from an upcoming uh, white paper that uh, will be in there. And it's like, while this wave of curricular preemption is still new and mostly limited in scope, targeting critical race theory and other named curricular options, state preemption of schools and school districts is of great concern to local school boards and communities. These bills target curricular related to Black and Indigenous people of peoples of color, explicitly aiming to prevent any forms of culturally relevant pedagogy or cultural responsive teaching in the name of protecting white students, parents, and communities from purported discomfort. You'll see later, like, this idea, the reason I think this is important is because we're not actually, so one of the things we used to always say is, like, this is a safe space. We want everyone to be safe. We're not, I think it's important that we differentiate between psychological comfort and safety, Right? Uh, this idea that I can't be faced with the idea that someone was oppressed or our, our, the history, the, the negative history of our country, or that's too discomforting. The other side is legally, I, I start wondering if we talk about vagueness and due process issues here, right? Like, how do I know it's going to cause you discomfort? And what is the measure for discomfort? And how much discomfort is, discom is uncomfortable enough that I trigger the law? Uh, for instance, if uh, I were to talk about the foundation of this country being built on slavery is, does that make people uncomfortable? And if it does, am I still allowed as an educator to have that conversation? I, I have two quotes. One is from uh, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves about when he signed his state uh, bill banning CRT. In too many schools, CRT is running amok. It threatens the integrity of education and aims to only humiliate. That's why I sign legislation that will help keep CRT where it belongs, out of Mississippi classrooms. Interestingly enough, Governor Reeves actually gives no 
actual cited example, no evidence that CRT is within, is, as he says, running amok in schools. He doesn't even say one example of where CRT is running and when I, it, it's, it's existing in Mississippi schools. And ideally, when people say things are someone like an idea is running amok, I'm thinking all the schools are doing it. A lot of schools are doing it. He provides none. Uh, something that's coming also from that white paper, conservatives appear to conflate the honest teaching of racism in American history with critical race theory. A theory that emanates from legal scholarship and is mostly prevalent, most prevalently discussed in institutions of higher education. And I don't know if this is uh, empirically true, but what I can say is in my experience, at least, uh, I didn't get to critical race theory until law school and grad school. Uh, so not even in undergrad where their course is specifically designed for CRT. That might have changed now because of changing trends. But I, but this even this idea of like it's in higher education, even, even higher ed students aren't whole, whole, holistically like taking these courses on CRT. Uh, a couple other things. So as you heard earlier, cur curricular preemption is not new and it's not it is generally legal. It's not banned by uh, any law, uh, but, but there's some things that are true about what's happening in our current context. So the student population in K-12 uh, public schools is shifting. So in 2009, uh, might sound many, many moons ago, I guess 13, uh, schools were predominantly white in the United States, uh, at least public uh, K-12 schools. Those schools are now predominantly people of color. Uh, and it's, about 54, 55%, and that number by 2030 will by far be a super majority. And all of this is connected to this wacky idea of a replacement theory that like somehow US immigration law is inviting people to come in to change the racial and ethnic background of the population in an effort to change the culture. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A. Uh, what I'll say is about these CRT bans, and I'm saying CRT bans, and, and, and that's what they're being called, but broadly, these bans on discussing anything related to race, ethnicity, gender, uh, sexual expression, I mean, gender expression, sexual identity, all, all of that is, I'm, in, I'm including for, uh, in this CRT bans discussion. Uh, it's all connected to the fear mongering around this replacement theory idea. And ultimately it's having clear human resources impacts on K-12 education as teachers are already leaving the field uh, and not filling, we're not, we, I can tell you in a college event, we don't have enough teachers to fill the vacant spots that we already are, are, are that we have just by natural uh, leaving of the, of teachers leaving the field naturally. And we also don't have enough specifically for the number of people just like, I'm out of here because I don't have this time for this kind of pressure or uh, oppression. I want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of bills uh, that I that I think I, I want to highlight as three examples that I think are exemplars of that's the right word uh, of what's happening. So I want to talk about Alabama, Idaho, and Missouri. Uh, and I feel like I'm picking on these states because when you think of states that might be doing this, these are states that might come to mind. Uh, so, like one thing, I, I want to talk about Alabama and this idea of what they what they seek out. So it's all in this like really interesting language, right? Among many things, the bill in Alabama seeks to respect the dignities of the dignity of others, acknowledge the rights of others to express differing opinions, and defend intellectual honesty, freedom of inquiry, and instruction, and freedom of speech and association. That is literally what the bill says. However, it requires termination for for making white people feel uncomfortable if any of these things are true. So you can defend intellectual honesty or freedom of inquiry so long as white people approve of it. Uh, while in Idaho, it's slightly different. Uh, while the Idaho bill banning the discussion of critical race theory purports to encourage Idaho schools to teach the whole and honest history of our nation, uh, a companion bill establishes a private cause of action. Other, right, other reason, a right to sue. Uh, a right to sue individual teachers uh, and a main mandated reduction in state funding for schools that teach concepts often associated with critical race theory. Uh, and it's all based in this unsupported claim in the legislation that uh, the tenets of CRT both inflame divisions uh, that are contrary to the unity, unity of this nation and the well-being of the state of Idaho, but also decide that idea that it's like morally reprehensible to make white students feel upset. 
Uh, and finally, Missouri uh, bans not only curricula that are associated with or related to the expansive definition of critical race theory that they use. Remember, in Missouri, they're talking about they list uh, the 1619 project. They list any multicultural. Uh, they list, I think, the Southern poverty, Southern poverty loss and teaching tolerance, or any derivative of it. Uh, but Missouri goes as far as listing a wide swath of curriculum that are also banned. These bans are targeted at even multicultural curricula, which is interesting because while critical race theory argues about critique of race and power, multicultural curricula typically are like, hey, we all need to get along. Even they are banned. Uh, and there are, Missouri issues financial consequences to these educational institutions that violate one or of its many bills banning critical race theory. There are at least 10 in Missouri. Uh, you're either going to lose 10% of your annual school funding or 50%, depending on <laughs> what you've done. Uh, another uh, quote, uh, states via curricula preemption are involving themselves uh, in, sorry, Employment matters requiring the censoring, sanctioning, and termination of teachers who challenge the status quo and or embrace pathways to a more culturally responsive and relevant instructional framework. In other words, the core of each of these bills and all others put forth during the recent legislative sessions is to stifle discussions of race and racism while purporting to protect the intellectual engagement, academic discussion, and freedom of speech and association. This idea that they can gaslight us and say, like, I want to have a discussion about race, but it cannot make me feel bad, and it has to position me as the victor. But this has served as a launching pad for a couple of other things, and I'm almost done. I told y'all 30 minutes, I'm going to make it at 4.30, and then we'll have discussion. Uh, we talk about Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill, which essentially uh, says you can't have these issues of gender uh, in before third grade, as if students before third grade aren't having these thoughts or having these questions, which also raises a really interesting point in the context of Florida. What happens if I'm a third, if I'm a second grade teacher and Johnny has two moms or two dads, but I can't have that discussion with the class that they bring it up because it would violate the don't say gay bill. Uh, and never once to be outdone by Florida, Arizona, Missouri, and Tennessee are leading the way in this. Uh, Arizona, for instance, has passed legislation that says you can only use uh, the gender assigned at birth in their schools. Uh, so even if someone was to get out of state, have gender reassignment uh, surgery, and come back as a new student with a new I ID, uh, you cannot. Uh, change, make that change. In Missouri, no one under 18 can even have, or there's a bill proposing that no one under uh, the age of 18 can have gender reassignment surgery. And in Tennessee, uh, as someone who just left Tennessee, I know this happens to be the case and it's in one of the Nashville suburbs is playing out right now. Books that uh, relate to LGBTQ uh, life uh, experiences uh, must be scoured to make sure they don't offend any citizen. Once again, this idea of like, what does, well, how do I know if something's going to offend citizens? As I wrap up with four slides stuff, I think, I want to give you a reason why we should think closely about local control. Uh, and Rodriguez, uh, Justice Powell states uh, in his argument for localized control over local funding, uh, the persistence of attachment to government at the lowest level where education is concerned reflects the depth of commitment of its supporters. In part, local control means, as Professor Coleman suggests, the freedom to devote more money to the education of one's children. Equally important, however, is the opportunity it offers for participation in the decision-making process that determines how those local tax dollars will be spent. Each locality is free to tailor local programs to local needs. Pluralism, also affords some opportunity for experimentation, innovation, and a healthy competition for educational excellence. An analogy to the nation-state relationship in our federal system, the nation-state relationship in our federal system seems uniquely appropriate. Mr. Justice Brandeis, identified as one of the identified as one of the peculiar strengths of our form of government, each state's freedom to serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experience. 
No area of social concern stands to profit more from a multiplicity of viewpoints and from a diversity of approaches than does public education. In other words, we actually think there might be benefit in having a uh, a variety of different school districts doing different things and maybe even in this conversation about what the curriculum might look like matters in that context. But the current trends and what this looks like is that we know these preemptions are usually anti-culturally responsive, anti-diversity, equity, and, inclu and inclusion. There is no clear evidence that usually supports that this legislation is resolving an ex existent problem. It's all like whipped up fear and generally it's coming from conservative or trending conservative states uh, when, when these legislation, pieces of legislation are most uh, restrictive ideal. I, I, and when I say trending conservative, I think of states like Missouri. What are the consequences? We starting to see, we're starting to see a chilling effect on things like teaching in a K-12 setting. There's confusion and ambiguity around what would break a law, what would be violative of what we think. Uh, should be true. And there's paranoia about who's in the room. Like, if I say something, will Sarah run home? Will Shantae run home and say to their parents, this is what's said, and now my license is, uh, is at stake. Uh, and there's stress regarding these your career after this. Like, what does it mean if my certification, my license is revoked, my employment is terminated, my promotion is denied because I have offended some parent doing something that uh, I, I didn't know was outlawed because uh, it wasn't clearly uh, delineated. Finally, this idea of uh, this is a continuation of framing educators as public enemy, number one. As a society, uh, we, we, we have to accept that we're changing and so are our discussions in the classroom and in society. Uh, these bears are flaming the flames of division. I'm sorry for that type I was trying to lowercase that D, uh, without uh, full knowledge of what they're opposed to. And uh, finally, there's been a uptick in, uh, an uptick in rot and hate crimes and hate speech uh, as we uh, combat these uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, what does this mean from a legal and political perspective? Uh, one, there's no clear-cut solution. States do have power to do what they're doing here. The question is, should we allow that? Uh, uh, but the, the one way we can battle this is with the, what has happened in Colorado, Georgia, Florida, and Virginia. Uh, there are state constitutional provisions that assign curricular control to local school boards, meaning that states actually cannot tell them what to put in their curriculum. Uh, then there's going to have to be some political advocacy and knowledge building around this. Uh, the truth of the matter is there's a report out of USC, Morgan Polakoff, uh, released it maybe two or three uh, months ago. And the big takeaway was that, funny enough, people who are opposed to CRT don't understand CRT. And they actually don't understand it even more than they don't understand. They admit they don't understand it. And so what we also know is that politically, these are extremes. Most people don't really care what's being taught, so long as it's being taught uh, fairly and openly. The other thing is, I think, I wonder what malicious compliance might look like in this context. And when I say malicious compliance, what I'm saying is, okay, this is what you said I have to do. I'm going to follow the word of the law. And sometimes things that you actually want me to teach, I can't teach because that would violate. So, someone would be uncomfortable. We can't teach anything. Uh, the only thing I also add is we have to be cautious of local control. There's a history here in this country of local control being used to thwart <laughs> uh, efforts at desegregation, at uh, diversity and inclusion, at the progress of people of color. I want to wrap up here before I uh, open the floor for questions. By the way, it's only four minutes after what I said I would do. Uh, I want to let y'all know on January 23rd, uh, I have two colleagues who will be joining uh, for an updated version of this. There we talk about uh, understanding emerging bilingual language bilinguals languages, language needs to create equitable educational practices. Uh, I'm super excited about that. I hope y'all will join us. Uh, my contact information, um, uh, Dr. Stephen L. Nelson. Uh, you can take me at stephen.nelson at unlv.edu. You can follow me on Twitter at Vinny L. Nelson. Any questions, comments, discussion? Also, if anyone wants to speak, please click on the raise hand button and they will allow you to talk. 
Dr. Roberts, uh, how will this impact bilingual education? You know, I, I, I don't know if the CRT bans in and of themselves might impact bilingual education, but I, I think we can't talk about like bilingual education uh, in a way that is removed from the recent push to minimize not only bilingual education, but like this idea of uh, broadly cultural assimilation as students come into the United States uh, without talking about the cultural wars that are at stake here. This idea that uh, while we may not ban bilingual education, although some states certainly have uh, or moved in a different direction at the bare minimum, I think there is the conversation that needs to be had about what does it mean uh, when you are bringing people into a context where their cultures can't be spoken about, uh, where their cultures can't be spoken about openly without fear of reprisal. Uh, and what, what, what are we setting up in that situation? You know, uh, additionally, I, I would add in many ways, the bilingual education, like, so if y'all probably remember maybe 15, 20 years ago, Arizona had a huge falling out. The state, almost the whole state fell out over its bilingual education program. And that was steeped in the same narrative, right? Like we shouldn't be, uh, and that was tied into some also stuff about like uh, Mexican history. Uh, yeah, it, it, it right. Uh, Dr. Roberts, definitely bilingual. It requires inclusion of a cultural component. What do you do when I can't have that, uh, if that makes sense? Uh, so I think it'll affect it that way, but I don't think it's a direct ban on bi bilingual education, but I think bilingual education will be less effective. I'm going to use that word, although I struggle with it at times, uh, because of the uh, ban on uh, the cultural components. I see a hand. I hope I answered your question, Dr. Roberts. Go ahead. I, I, I don't know if I'm calling. Yes, myself. actually, I'm going to uh, allow Dr. Hartley to speak. One second, please. Please go ahead. OK, thank you. Hi, Dr. Nelson. This was great. Thank you. Um, very informative. And I, um, it makes me really question my media streams because I didn't I recognize these things are happening. But the, the large number of them and all the recent uh, events, um, it isn't hitting what I'm following. So I need to. Um, probably start following you on Twitter, I guess. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about, I when I was first started looking into this, it was, um, I don't know how long ago this was, but with the Texas legislation around um, discussing race in the classrooms. And so I kind of dug into that a little bit and it just, it just blew me away. Um, the, um, the idiocy of it, I, 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 my sense was you couldn't, it would have been illegal to talk about the law in a class. Like to actually introduce that law to tell the students about the state legislation would have been illegal. I don't know. You mentioned some of these cases where it just seems it's so circuitous and ridiculous that I, I just don't understand how people uh, come up with these things. You, you know, uh, so Juan, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I, I'll, I'll definitely say I like you have, I, I've, I've cultivated an echo chamber and I'm, okay with that uh, in this, in, on social media. If I have to deal with it in life, I'm not gonna have to deal with it in my own socially constructed uh, area. I, I think for me, uh, the ways that I've been coming across this is uh, really from a lot of my friends who are stunned that this is a thing, right? That like, as you said, the, the idiocy of it, like how could this even be? Uh, but for a while, we've started seeing this in the curriculum, right? Structuring what teachers can say, what things might offend certain people. I think we're just calling it what it is now. For a while, remember Texas, that was the big brouhaha, the big kerfuffle about uh, Texas saying that we're not going to use the word slave anymore. We're going to use, I forgot what it was. It was like, it was a forced migration. And it was like, I mean, I guess technically it is a forced migration, but like if you force me into migration and I have to work for free for you, like, we actually have a name for that too, and it's slavery. So this idea, uh, I think, I think you're you're right. It's hard to even think this, and, and I wonder to some extent if the people who are advocating for uh, the politicians who are advocating for this really 
truly believe what they're saying or if this is just a way of stoking uh, racial tensions. Oh. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question, Dr. Hartley. Yes, no, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roberts says, do you think this issue may cause a migration of teachers from anti-states to other states? So, possibly, but I actually think not in this one sense. Uh, what we know is people are just leaving the field. I, 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 Cause like, I don't think this one thing is the thing that's forcing them out of the field. I think this is a, com is a combination of a one deprofessionalization of uh, the teaching force, uh, a lack of ability to move up, a uh, consistent underpayment. I guess everyone feels underpaid, but I mean, specifically when you do the numbers on teaching, it's, it's actually wild how underpaid teachers are, specifically in relation to like broadly the money you spend getting a degree ultimately to only be paid X, Y, and Z as the cost of college and in, in, uh, post-secondary education increases. But I think this last thing is just kind of like, a look, I I'm not going to deal with this. Uh, there's, in Arizona, they're requiring, in Arizona and Indiana, actually, they're requiring teachers to have their lessons done a year in advance, to have parents come and check to see that the lessons are okay. If the lessons are not okay, you have to start over. So I guess you have to have, like, if we're backwards planning, you have to have your, I would, I would assume you have to have your lessons done. Let's say school starts the first week of August. So let's say you probably need to have them done in July because in case you have to redo them. And if you, do, if you diverge from these lessons, which let's be clear, as we all were educators at one point in some way or another, we all know that, like, in any given day, you change your lesson plan. Uh, maybe students didn't receive the lesson as well as you thought they would. Maybe... Uh, there was a fire drill and you couldn't actually uh, complete the lesson, you're in trouble in those states if you change your lesson. Like, it actually doesn't even make sense practically. And I actually don't know, and maybe I'm about to reveal, maybe I wasn't as great of a teacher as I thought I was. I actually don't know any teachers who had their whole lessons planned a year in advance. Like, and to this day, I don't think I've known any. Whether I supervised them, whether I worked with them, I mean... So let's be clear, even as a college professor, I, I barely, I know what I want to teach throughout the year, but I mean, of course things change, right? Uh, other questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, or disputes? Hey, Dr. Roberts. Hey, one second, please. Please go ahead. If if all this is happening, um, how are how are we going to how will that impact our like in our case our EPL program? You know, for us, well, without sharing too much, for us at the for the part of our program that focuses on. Nevada, we're actually in a pretty good shape because Nevada actually has no, well, up until recently has no, no pending legislation to restrict mm -hmm. conversations about race. And I'm actually not sure politically why that's the case. Uh, I, I would assume, I mean, not to pick on people outside of Southern Nevada, that there would be people in other parts of the state like clamoring to, to oppress us. But that's actually not happened so far. And I don't know if it was because they knew it had no chance of passing. I also do know that uh, Nevada has kind of had both a uh, Democrat and the governor's uh, mansion, but also uh, Democratic uh, state houses. So I, I don't know if that's what's stopping mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the possibility. I think that's when we start thinking about expanding EPL nationally, right? Mm -hmm. I, those conversations are are in one of two buckets. Either we say we have to be careful and teach students how to be double agents. This idea of like, yes, you have to, we don't want you to get fired. And even at my school law courses, I tell, so it's like, I don't want you to go up to the superintendent tomorrow, curse them out, you know, flip them <laughs> off and get fired. My hope is that you as a practice are 
essentially making sure you do compliance, but also advocating for your students. Uh, and specifically, one of the things I told my students, I'm going to teach you what the expectation is in terms of law, so that when you know that when you break, when you decide not to enforce a law or a policy, you can actually argue why. And chiefly, you should be arguing that such an enforcement would be inequitable or would lead otherwise to uh, an outcome that would turn the intent of that piece of legislation upside down. Because mm-hmm. I, I know that that our our state standards include, you know, making sure that we are culturally responsive to students and so forth. So I'm not really concerned about like Nevada, but those states that do have those issues, you know, what's going to happen to their, to their programs. I mean, you you know, so, so two, two things, right? So K-12 teachers don't have as much academic freedom. Uh, They very have, they have very little actually, but at the, collegiate level, at the post-secondary level, we have a lot of academic freedom and we can dictate our own, uh, what we think, I mean, we're we're content experts, right? I'm dictating in law what I think students should learn, what I think is important, how they should learn it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'll be okay in higher ed in most places. I think there are a couple of states that are challenging tenure and and those protections. Obviously, Wisconsin has been one place that's happened. Florida is another. Georgia is another where it's on the table. Uh, and, and what they're trying to do is basically position higher ed as this, like, we get to tell them what to do so that then they can control the curriculum. And this is why you're starting to see some of that pushback against accreditation in higher ed. Because mm-hmm. we're starting to see accrediting bodies, i.e. CAPE, which I just went through at Memphis, basically saying, this is how we want you to teach this. And then people are saying, well, but what happens to my academic freedom if I must teach this the way that you told me to teach it? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. We'll be okay in Nevada, at least for the next few years, maybe a few decades. Mm -hmm. I think there are some states uh, that I I, I think professors should be a little bit more worried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, the the U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear about, well, the U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear about their preference for academic freedom for higher ed. But of course, this is a new breed of Supreme Court and we don't know what they'll do. So uh, there we are with that. Yeah. Well, and I thought I had heard about some states uh, being upset at some some instructors because of their comments. Yep. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. So a uh, comment and then a question, I guess. So uh, I've been here long enough to have a, too much history probably, but the, back to the question of why we don't have some of these uh, uh, reactionary um, types of um, language. This, when I moved here, it was actually pretty heavily Republican um, legislatures, the um, both houses and the governor's office. However, um, and this maybe even preceded me a bit, but there's a very strong uh, libertarian bend to the state, which, which now you you look at these, all these other States and it's, it makes you wonder, well, what happened to, you know, conservatism, you know, staying out of uh, uh, local um, control. So yeah, you're, I'm sure the irony is not lost on you at all. (laughs) But then I guess my question that's my comment. And, and then, so actually then what happens, we really have had this kind of democratic wave that was well-timed in the sense that the, when these, all these things were happening across the country, if, if it had been 15 years ago and those same types of things were happening, I, it, we'd probably be in a very different situation right now. Um, but then my question then is, so about, what about these, I'm thinking particularly K-12 teachers, what, what do you, what do we know about their protections or how can they protect themselves? Um, you know, do they need to have a, um, you know, a lawyer on hand. I'm, I'm not convinced that the school districts are going to, um, um, they seem to be more in the business of covering their own concerns, <laughs> their own legal back than the actual teachers. And, you know, what do you tell them about um, what they say? And I have one particular example that really worried me too. I was asking students in a uh, summer course to um, incorporate into the uh, project that they were going to do this curriculum. Um, ways to address the diverse needs of their students. And they had to like directly address these things, um, whether that be race, gender, um, ethnicity. They, and the student happened to be from Elko, 
And the school board just the night before had been ranting and raving about certain teachers and what they were teaching. <laughs> so here I'm asking the student to do these things because, in, in, you know, the, the expectation was too, they would actually use this in class. So here I'm almost asking him to not break the law, of course, in the state, but certainly put his um, concern for his job. So, so protections for teachers. I don't know. You know, I, I, I mean, some of this is going to be union work. Uh, I, I actually do not, I have no faith that school districts will stand up for teachers. Uh, and, and in fact, I recently uh, had one of my friends who, uh, I sued schools for a living, but one of my, many of my friends were school district attorneys. And I, in a class, I was having a conversation with her in front of my, so I was like, yeah, y'all, your district attorney, your representatives. And she said, let's keep in mind that school district attorneys do not represent teachers. I represent the school district. I, she was like, I will represent teachers to the point where our, I guess, interests align, but if they depart, like, like you're the first person to get thrown in front of the bus. Like, so I think you're right there. What I, what I would say, though, is I think some of this is going to be constitutional challenges. And that's what you're starting to see. And, and part of it is really getting how far do schools get to say, the states get to say schools uh, dictate the curriculum? Because now we're actually not, we're getting beyond what's right. And can states now start saying, you have to present factually inaccurate information? Or more so, the question that I've been asking everyone and that I'm advocating for among my advocacy circles is, when do we start talking about the Constitution in terms of due process? Right. These, these laws are so vague that they've created a chilling effect. Like you actually don't know what's illegal. Yeah. Like, cause the idea that the test is it makes someone uncomfortable. I mean, like, how do you measure? Is there a comfort measure somewhere? <laughs> like, I mean, like, like after I give my talk, I was a history teacher. I give my talk on, you know, on, on the Holocaust. Will someone come behind me with like, you know, that little thing on a doctor's office with like their faces, like in a worse when it's crying, like, do they, literally point to those and say, like, which of these does the class feel yeah. like? Uh, in many ways, I, I think we are in a place right now where um, we have to start saying, like, constitutionally, I don't know. This is vagueness. This is overbroad. Like, I don't even, like, I don't, like, so ideally, you get off any time in a law where the law has not been actually uh, explained in, in, in very specific ways. In other words, knowing what the violative behavior is and what the likely punishment is. At this point, I'm not sure what is yeah. it's like in, like literally in Missouri, the conversation is about, you can't make someone feel bad. Like not even uncomfortable. Like I might bite uncomfortable, but feel bad. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah. like what, it, I mean, like the other day, someone was literally talking about Hurricane Katrina. I'm from New Orleans. I felt bad. Like, are they not allowed to? <laughs> like, I mean, like and, and I'm not saying that people should just do it recklessly, but at what point is it like, look, you, you're going to have to just feel bad and we'll, we'll deal with that over time. Yeah. And the other part is, is education broadly, we have to start arguing even politically. Is it about feeling good? Like, I mean, surely we want people to feel good when they finish their degrees and through their process, but aren't there some things we learn that we're uncomfortable with? Yeah, no, I, I appreciated your distinction there between discomfort and safety. Um, and I, uh, Robin D'Angelo talks about this too. That was really helpful for me, the concept that it's time for people to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, particularly, you know, white males like myself. So um, yeah, that was... I, well, the thing that strikes me in what you said there, though, too, is so they don't have to. It's almost to the advantage of those who want to per, uh, perpetuate these policies to not be specific, because now a teacher's in a school and the principal could just easily say, hey, we've got this law. You can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. You can't be doing all these things. And without that specificity, there's nothing that the teacher can do. They're, they're just, and that's what I find, you know, even in higher ed, you get um, pressures to do this or that um, that aren't really in line with policy or there isn't a policy that says, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but yet they're in a position where you can't really question them. So it just, <laughs> right? that's, that, that's really going to be the case for these teachers. I mean, their principal says this 
this is what's happening. And the principal can easily say, well, it's because of this law. So, Well, and think about this, like, think about, like, I've had students ask me what was illegal. And, and, and think about this world in which, like, someone who did this for a living has studied it, like, both in terms of studying the practice of law, but also studying law and, like, its impact. Like, I'm at a loss for words uh, of, like, what you can and can't. Like, I, I mean, I suppose you can, you know, I mean, like, am I allowed to talk about 9-11? Because presumably it might make some people on both sides uncomfortable. Uh, and, and this idea, like, it's interesting because I've actually been critiqued in my class. I used to teach the race, ethnicity, and gender course at the University of Memphis. And I was told <laughs> in uh, a meeting with the dean, just like, someone said that they don't feel safe in your class. I was like, no one has ever been physically assaulted. Like, no one's been threatened to be physically assaulted. No one has. And I was like, she was like, well, they're seeing like emotion. I was like, literally, we're talking about discomfort now. Yeah, like, right. yeah. And this is not like physical safety. I think we should be worried about. But the chances are, I don't know, I've never had a class, and I think most of us have never had a class where someone physically assaulted another student or, or a faculty member. Maybe people felt that way to some extent, but I was like, I just don't know where we go with this idea of, like, even our most impressive legal minds don't understand these laws and what's, what's being banned. Well, if there's no other questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, or disputes, thank y'all for joining. Uh, I really appreciate y'all attending. And I, you know how to get in touch with me. I'm always available and love talking about this stuff because I don't get to talk about it enough. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing y'all around. <laughs>